Hi folks, we are on the last lesson for Unit 2. Um, we're going to talk about some real life applications of the dot product and cross product. Um, for any of you going into uh, university level courses in physics or engineering, you will be seeing a lot more um, of these types of questions in your later studies, but just to kind of give you a an overview, we're going to look at three specific examples of how we can apply the dot product and cross product to um, sort of real life situations and calculations in the sciences. So we talked when we learned the cross product um, that the magnitude of the cross product was the area of the parallelogram formed by um, formed by this, these two vectors. And we also um, can use that to come up with this equation of how to find the cross product with geometric vectors. So we know how to use algebraic vectors with our like writing the numbers down or memorizing the big messy formula. But since we know that the cross product is the area of the parallelogram uh, that's formed, we know that the area of a parallelogram is base times height. So this is my base. So the base is the magnitude of vector A, and that's kind of arbitrary, the, the order here doesn't matter. Um, and then the height will be um, we can find from this right angled triangle. So if we kind of take a look here to figure out what the height is at this 90 degree triangle by dropping down a perpendicular height, we know that H over the magnitude of B is the sine of theta. So just using Sakatoa there, so that then H would equal the magnitude of B times sine theta. So the height is the magnitude of B times sine theta, and the base is the magnitude of A, and that gives us a measurement for how we can calculate the cross product if we have geometric vectors. And also just a reminder that the magnitude of the cross product gives you the area of that parallelogram, whether or not A and B vectors are given in arithmetic or algebraic or geometric form. There's no arithmetic vectors, I made that up. Okay, so we have two vectors here. What's the area of the parallelogram defined by vectors A and B. So again, um, hopefully you guys have practiced enough with the day seven work that you remember how to do this. The area, remember that that's the magnitude of the cross product. The cross product gives us a vector and area obviously is just a scalar quantity. So I'm going to have to find the magnitude of the cross product. But to find the magnitude, I have to find the cross product. So I will go through my process here and write down both vectors twice. And we cross out the top one and the bottom one and don't use those. So here we're going to do down minus up. So if 3 times negative 1 is 3, minus 10 is negative 7 for the x, and again down minus up, multiplying 5 times 4 is 20, minus negative 1, so plus 1. Make sure you're careful with those double negatives, that's a common spot for little errors to happen, is the y coordinate, y component is 21, and 1 times 2 minus negative 3 times 4. So 2 minus negative 12 is like plus 12. So I would get 14. So my area is going to be the magnitude of vector negative 7, 21, 14. 
and then that's going to be the square root of negative 7 squared plus 21 squared plus 14 squared. So if I take those numbers each and square it, I get the square root of 686. Um, because this isn't um, a word problem and it's not indicating decimal places, I would leave that as um, an exact value. But um, we could actually multi change this into a mixed radical if you wanted. You should know how to do that. I won't necessarily, I won't require this or take off marks if you don't, but you may need to to check your answers. So 686 is a product of 49 and 14. I tried the 49 as my perfect square because I saw all those multiples of 7 up in the question. And that is 7 root 14. So we're going to leave this exact unless it is a word problem. So um, if, for instance, you were looking for, there's, you know, given some points in three dimensions and like the, the area of the parallelogram was the a piece of a boat or the size of a garden or something like that, you'll want to do an exact value. But otherwise, if it's just kind of in general, we'll leave it um, exact and not round that off to two decimals. The next application of the dot product that we're going to look at is work. So for those of you who have taken physics, you may have seen this. I believe it's in the grade 12 physics course. But work is basically the product of the distance an object has been displaced and the component of force that's being applied to the object along the line of displacement. So if we have, I'll try and like draw a little diagram here. If we have an object and it gets moved to a new spot. So it has a displacement there. And maybe it had a force that was, that was used to move that object, but the force wasn't exactly in the direction of the displacement. So this is going from here to here. Um, if you're pulling that box with, a, I don't know, a rope or whatever, um, and you move it along this line of displacement, so a horizontal, the work is the product of the displacement here and the amount of the force that is working in the direction of the displacement. So this is kind of like a projection. It's that this really is the projection of the force onto the line of displacement times the displacement. And we know that that's the dot product, right? It's the one magnitude of one vector times how much of the other vector is working with it. So work is equal to the force applied dotted with the displacement. And we're going to use S for displacement. Okay. So force is measured in newtons, which we know. Displacement is in meters. So work is measured in something called a joule, which is one newton meter. So that's how much work gets done when you move one, when you use one newton of force to move an object one meter. So one joule is equal to one newton of force moving an object one meter, and that would kind of keep our units correct in there. So here's my 
force is W and it's moving an object to distance in meters along this vector. So it has this displacement and that force. And to find the work, we just find the dot product of these two. So it's 37.29. So 3 times 2 plus 7 times 9. So 69 joules of work was performed. Now remember that dot product gives us a scalar answer. So we do not have a vector. Work is not a vector, it's just a scalar. So it won't have a direction. Okay, this one, so the previous example with work had um, uh, the algebraic vectors. Here we've got more of a geometric situation. So we have a ramp and there's a crate sitting on the ramp. So I'm going to draw an object that's to get moved up the ramp. So the crate is hauled 8 meters up the ramp. So my displacement vector goes up the ramp and it has a constant it's moved with a constant force of 20 newtons applied at 30 degrees to the ramp so we don't know how big this ramp is but we know that the force here is at a 30 degree angle to the displacement of my object so we know that work equals the force dot with the displacement. And here we don't have the algebraic vectors to find dot product, but we know what dot product is. It's the magnitude of one times the magnitude of the other times the cos of the angle between it. So here, the magnitude of the force was 20 newtons, so I'll have 20 times the magnitude of the displacement, which is eight meters, times cos 30. And because this is very much kind of a real life word problem, we are going to round this off to two decimal places. So we've got 138.556 joules. So 130, whoops, that was 138. 138.56 joules of work was done. Okay, I have one last example here, and this is an example of the cross product and application in real life. So the last kind of physics example here is torque. So torque is a rotational force. So um, we know that forces are vectors and we know that the, um, the cross product gives us an actual vector. So torque is going to have a vector answer. Um, torque is going to be the R cross F where R is the position vector of the radial arm. So torque, and here's a picture of a wrench. Torque is the kind of thing that happens when you're turning things or rotating something. So kind of a common example that I like to look at, um, but is harder to do on a video, is just simply opening a door. If you push on a door, it's going to rotate open. If you're pushing on a door, um, and I'll just kind of draw, I'm going to draw a door. So here's my hallway, here's my door. If it rotates here, like here's the hinges on the door, and there's the doorknob, 
if you push on the door in here, it's going to be harder to open it. Normally we push on a door over here farther away from where it rotates. So if it rotates along here, this is the uh, part of the door that's attached on those hinges. The further out towards the doorknob you push, the easier it is to open a door. So if you're at home watching this, you can go right now, just try opening a door in your house try pushing it here versus here. You're going to be able to get a lot more rotational force or uh, force of um, the door rotating open for the same amount of effort pushing if you go further out along the door. And that's going to be true as well if you were using a wrench. So if you had a wrench and you were trying to loosen a bolt, if you have a longer wrench and you're further away from this point, which is called the moment of where your turning moment is, where the rotation is happening, the further out here that you're pushing and applying that force, the bigger of a rotation you're going to get, and that's the torque. So a few different things can affect this. First of all, the, um, the magnitude of the torque is going to be the magnitude of r times the magnitude of the force times sine theta. So if we think about kind of these three components, if r is bigger, the magnitude of the torque is going to be bigger. So if you're pushing further out along that wrench, if you're pushing here versus here, you're going to get more torque, more rotational energy. And if you have a bigger force, if you push harder, on this wrench, it's going to have more rotational force. It will turn more. And the angle. Normally, we if you were pushing a wrench, you would push right on there. This force being at this angle is actually kind of counterproductive. This is, we know that sine theta has a maximum at theta equals 90 degrees. So if you push at a 90 degree angle versus if you push on a kind of more diagonal force, you're going to get more torque, okay? Torque is also measured in joules, and you just have to remember that it is the cross product there. So I know that, so we wanna find the magnitude of torque. So the magnitude of the cross product, so that's my, radius crossed with the force that I'm using is the magnitude of the radius times the magnitude of the force times sine theta, which we saw from the area of the parallelogram. That's kind of an explanation of why this works. So I have the force is 15 newtons applied at the edge of a door at an angle of 70 degrees if the door is 80 centimeters wide. One thing really to watch in here, because torque is measured in joules, there's not too much tricky we can do with this. So joules is a Newton meter. So you have to have Newtons for your force and meters for your radius. So just make sure if you're given a measurement that's not in meters that you're converting it to meters before you do the calculation. So my radius is 0 0.8 meters. My force is 15 Newtons, that's good. And then times sine 70. So my torque is going to be 11.28 joules. So therefore the magnitude So again, real life word problems, you're gonna round off to two decimal places. So that is the end of unit two.
there is a um, review section and um, some review problems, including some proofs that are really good to take a look at. And those will be listed on your outline as well.